Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the North Carolina Museum of History. And we're so glad that you're joining us as we celebrate Earth Day, which is taking place later this month, uh, with today's virtual History at High Noon, the fight for the Eno. Um, we ask that you please type any questions that you have uh, for our guest speaker into the chat function that's located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of the lecture, our adult programs intern will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome our speaker today, Lawson Osteen. Lawson is a park ranger at Eno River State Park and was born and raised in Durham along the Eno River. He went to school at Appalachian State to earn a degree in environmental biology. Since moving back home and beginning work at the park, he has enjoyed looking for turtles and salamanders, but has also developed an interest in the local history scattered throughout the park. Lawson, I'm gonna turn things over to you. Welcome, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, everybody, uh, so much for having me. This is always um, an exciting talk to give. Um, a little bit about myself, as Stacy said, um, I am born and raised here in Durham. Um, growing up for me, this was always uh, a place that I didn't really go to. Um, even though it was my backyard, I grew up in a neighborhood along the park. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but vacations were always, you know, to the mountains, to the beach, um, to cooler places, um, whereas, you know, my backyard seemed kind of boring. And so coming back to, to Durham and getting able to work here now, um, having this opportunity um, has been a really fun opportunity for me starting to get into history. Um, I'll talk about a little bit of science uh, to start out and kind of my um, what my interest in the park. Um, but then I really got into this kind of history um, because a lot of it is very recent and something that could easily be lost, um, but it's also quite interesting all the work that went into um, to forming the park. So let me get situated real quick, okay, and we'll get started. So when I first um, came back to Eno River, I started to get information and hear about from other rangers and other locals about how the park was formed. Um, but what really interested me is that the Special Collections Library at um, UNC Chapel Hill has the Margaret Nygaard collection, which is a lot of paperwork from um, her personal stores, as well as you know, River Association papers, um, lots of letters and documents and things from, from the time. And so I got a chance to look through those and kind of put together some of these pieces with um, a little extra little personal touch. And so it started out as a guided hike along the river. Um, a park naturalist who worked with me, we developed this into a PowerPoint and a presentation for the Speakers Bureau, which also focused on other women in state parks. Um, but then it became, for me, um, just kind of focused on Margaret Nygaard, but also the Eno River Association. That being said, especially today in Durham and the Triangle being a little cloudy, I always like to bring a little bit of sunshine with me. Um, so we've got some some moss here, some luna moss there at the bottom, and I really enjoy salamanders. Um, so this is just kind of showcasing what's you, what you can find at the river, um, what you can find out in the park, and what makes it so special to me as well. Start to set the stage for what we're looking at. We have um, a few of the key players in our story today. We have Margaret Nygaard and the Eno River Association. We have the city of Durham, we have the state of North Carolina, and we have the Nature Conservancy. Um, a point that I'll echo throughout this whole conversation is that we focus on Margaret a lot. Um, she was kind of the face of this movement, especially now historically we remember her the most, um, but there were a lot of families, a lot of people, uh, many of whom are still alive or their kids are still alive and are still involved. Um, it was a major community effort um, to get the park preserved. And I'll also talk later on about, even though we're kind of on the other side of history from the city of Durham, that they were actually being really responsible in this conversation about trying to find a water source. <clears throat> if anybody is unfamiliar with Eno River State Park, um, we cover about 4,300 acres of land, um, and we also manage Okanichi Mountain State Natural Area in Hillsborough, um, over in Orange County as well. Um, most of Eno River State Park spreads the Orange County, Durham County line. We have 14 miles of the river covered. We have about 25 miles worth of trails and we have five major accesses with a lot of neighborhood accesses spread out. So there are a lot of different areas to enjoy. There's also a lot of history out there. We have hiking, camping, fishing, of course, all the things you expect of a state park. 
I like to put paddling in question mark um, because our average running depth on the river in the summer especially is only about a foot. And so most people who try to kayak or tube down the river end up scraping bottom most of the way. Um, but our website highlights the wonderful paddling that we have and that's always a little bit funny to me. Um, another one just to, to help set the stage here. Um, this is a map of the whole park. Um, up in the upper left under the University Park sign um, is our main access called Fuse Ford. Um, that's where our most trails is, our most acreage, um, the suspension bridge and our visitor centers, everything there, um, as well as some of the camping. But then you can see how it spreads south um, and there's a lot of jagged boundaries. So there's a lot of private development along the river. Um, of course, now there's um, more and more dense housing, um, but a lot more uh, acre lots and a lot of spread out private development um, that preceded the park. So we also have the Pleasant Green, Cave Lands, Cold Mill and Pump Station accesses. And like I said, there's a lot of little neighborhoods where you can pop in and out of the park, um, a lot of different ways to get out into the area. So for our visitation, um, our 2019 visitation, we saw 630,000 people. Um, and this is just for Eno River. And 2020, um, the great year of COVID, we see it jump. Um, and then 2021, it keeps on rising. 2022, and I don't have 2023 on here, um, but it kind of did the same thing where we're still up into those 800,000 numbers. Um, if we combine those numbers with Okanichi, especially the 2020 and 2021 numbers, we saw over a million visitors um, to the Eno River along the um, Okanichi and Eno River State Park accesses. So that placed us not the top park for those years. Um, I think some of the reservoirs, which have a lot of camping, have more, um, but we puts us as one of the most visited, um, more day use kind of parks. Our park master plan, which would have been created in the 70s um, and finalized, I think, around 1980 or so, had an estimated visitation of about 230,000. That was, of course, a different time and close to 50 years ago uh, when some of these ideas were getting started, um, but even accounting for increased visitation, they did not for, uh, foresee this many people. Um, this kind of has been our new number, new normal, this many people coming. Um, a lot of our clear weekends, um, a lot of our nice pretty days are gonna seem like holidays. What used to just be Memorial Day or Labor Day, July 4th, now um, happens on any random Saturday or any random um, Sunday. A little bit of history on Margaret herself um, to give a background on her. She is one of the more prominent people associated with the preservation of the Eno River. But as I said earlier, I do need to acknowledge that there are a lot of founding members um, who gave a lot of effort um, and have their own legacies to pass down and did a lot of good um, activism to help get the Eno River Association and the Eno River preserved. Um, Margaret and her husband Holger had moved to Durham and they fell in love with an old miller's house along the river. Um, and of course, they fell in love with the river themselves. Um, great picture here on the side of Margaret down there on the water. Um, you can see that it's a great place for anybody who hasn't been before. Over time, uh, Margaret was involved in a lot of different projects. Um, she helped, of course, to protect the Eno. She also lent help to Umstead Park in Raleigh, as well as Jockey's Ridge. And she also helped out with the North Carolina School of Forestry program on some issues and even had the chance to speak before Congress. Um, our story for this fight for the Eno begins um, in 1965. The city of Durham starts to buy up land and they want to build a dam. They want to make a reservoir out of the Eno River. Um, Margaret, her husband Holger and several other residents of Durham um, get together and form the Eno Historical Society which starts to preserve, <clears throat> sorry, starts to present the history and the uniqueness of the River Valley. Um, this starts to lay the foundation for the you know, River Association as we know it today, and also is the origin of the emphasis on the intrinsic, intrinsic value of the Eno River. That's something I'll highlight later on about the association is that their fight and their arguments for a state park um, and preserving the river as is was about the beauty of the river, the uniqueness, the geology, the biology, um, instead of just being somebody trying to protect their backyard. 
Um, really with this kind of background, there's some of the, you can see them as some of the first park rangers. They were doing our jobs um, very early on in presenting some of that science. In 1966, there was a massive fish kill on the river, um, came from a chemical spill. A fatty alcohol had spilled from a truck on I-85 and it creeped downstream through the river at about two miles a day. Um, however, it took about a week for the local newspapers to pick up the story and, and start reporting it. Within five days, the decil alcohol, the fatty alcohol had reached the Noose River. Um, 14 days after the spill, so a full two weeks, the state had begun to investigate the accident. Um, the company responsible was fined about $5,000, um, which the Wildlife Commission used to restock the river. And that was kind of the end of that for, for those parties involved. <clears throat> Even though the Nygaards and other community members had already formed the Eno Historical Society, um, this event, especially remarked um, by the Nygaard family, as kind of taking um, the inspiration for that next step in their activism to really start to work harder um, and become much more active in being able to preserve the Eno River. Now, we are on the side of history that remembers Margaret um, and the association fondly for all their efforts um, and during their fights. But of course, there are people out there who would think otherwise. Um, she was often criticized at the time as a Rip Van Winkle, saying that she was too old or too out of step to understand that progress requires destruction. Um, Margaret had also described herself as a thorn in the flesh to Durham Mayor Graberic and others like Nello Tier, um, who was a gl local global construction company and still has um, some influence in the area today. Excuse me, so sorry. Since she and the association, um, they would have received awards um, along with the mayor, um, despite also fighting against them. Um, one story told by Margaret in a letter to a friend was that in receiving a Keep America Beautiful Award, for cleaning up trash near West Point um, Park along the Eno, which is now a city park. Um, they flew to New York on the private jet of Nello Tier um, to receive their reward, um, the mayor, Nello Tier, as well as many people from the uh, Eno group. Margaret remarked in that letter to a friend about the irony of being recognized um, with this group because she and the association had already fought and defeated the mayor on different bond issues. Um, and had also fought with others here about the expansion of Umstead State Park. The powder keg that kicked off this whole fight is that Durham needs a new water source. Um, Durham's first formal water source was a dam called Pump Station, which was along the Eno River and is still within the park today. Um, and you can actually visit the ruins of the building. And I have another program that um, goes into some of this history that's also really cool. Um, it was built in the 1870s um, and 80s as things got started. Um, and one of the interesting things about this is that when Durham passed the bonds to build a municipal water source, um, they realized that they didn't have the funding. And so it was turned into a private water source um, that was then sold to city residents at the price of $6 a year. Um, from our picture here, what we're seeing is the Eno River, um, the pump house is the smaller building. Um, the bigger building there is a filter house. And what we're seeing is the dam across that river that was used to power the pump. Um, a nearby creek that's on the other side of those buildings was actually flooded and dammed up. And that's the actual water that was um, provided to Durham. Throughout the operation of the pump station, it was plagued by spotty service, mismanagement, and financial worries, um, as well as the person running the company, defaulting on loans for this construction and others. And so in 1916, Durham began to um, build Lake Mickey on the Flat River. After a completion of Lake Mickey and a reservoir on Hillendale Road, the pump station continued to be a backup supply of water. At some point later, it was abandoned and the dam along the river um, was either removed or fell over and some of the big flooding. Just because there were other sources now for water doesn't mean that the idea of using the Eno ever was abandoned. Estimates have been done in 1911 and 1917 as to how high a dam would need to be and how much water the reservoir could yield. 
So the information was out there and the idea was still possible and, and kind of always floating around. The estimate from 1917 said that a 100 foot dam could yield about 70 million gallons a day. The later estimates in 1962, so a lot closer to our story today, estimated that a 105 foot dam, so a little bit taller, would only yield about 50 million gallons a day. Um, seeing that trend there, that's something to point out that as the more and more we looked into the Eno River um, as a water source, the less and less likely it actually became. Um, wasn't quite as good of a place as they might have thought. So if we jump ahead and to the 50s and 60s, um, that's when our story picks up and the idea of the Inner River Reservoir um, really comes back into the picture. Um, now, I, I mentioned earlier that Durham deserves some credit um, because they were looking to their future before actually running out of water. Raleigh is also a little bit of a partner in this story. Um, they are much closer to their water needs running out. Um, and so any kind of solution was gonna provide water for Raleigh first. And then once Raleigh could build something such as Jordan Lake, or Falls Lake, then they would use that, for, uh, Durham would gain control of the water afterwards. Um, so Durham was looking ahead. They anticipated that by the 90s or the 2000s that they would be overpopulated and out of water. Um, so they're really trying to get a, an early leap on everything. Um, since the Eno had already been dammed before, it was a natural choice for them to try to do it again. Um, and they had even created plans for a recreational facility, um, much the same way that we provide different recreation opportunities in, in our park and also that Jordan Lake and Falls Lake have different things like camping. Um, Durham was looking to create an area that had swimming, a scenic drive, a theater, and had research opportunities. Uh, we even talked about offering swim lessons and different community outreach things. So there was a lot of urban, de urban development and a lot of good planning um, that Durham was trying to do with this reservoir. Um, so again, we're on the wrong side of history, for opposite side of history um, in this story, but they were really doing a good job at trying to plan ahead. So this is a document, um, a map that I found in the Margaret Nygaard collection that shows um, where the dam could have gone. Um, I've seen reports that it would have been closer to Guest Road as well as closer to Cold Mill. Um, this map seems to kind of split the difference a little bit. I don't know how accurate it is on the water surface, which is highlighted there in red, um, up by where I've marked Cold Mill and Guest Road. Um, we've got it kind of right there in the middle. Um, but since there are several different estimates about how large the lake would have been, um, this at least gives us a starting point. Something that I like to point out, which is hard to kind of do um, here on the screen, but right about where the dam is, is actually where the neighborhood I grew up in. Um, and that road is actually not on this map. Um, it hadn't been built yet during this planning process. And so it's just kind of a nice little personal touch for me, knowing that if this reservoir had been built and this dam had gone through, um, things could be a lot different for me. <clears throat> on the left, we've got Como Road, um, where it crosses the rate, uh, where it crosses through the red line is our Como Road, and that's where the Cold Mill access is. Um, this Cold Mill access is actually where I started doing this program and hiking along the riverbank there. Um, really helps to set a scale of just how high 100 feet would have been, um, how much water would have been built up into this reservoir. This is another map. This one's been put together um, by a gentleman who named uh, Joe Lyles, who does a lot of mapping and a lot of research into the park, um, has done a lot of history of different trading paths and roads. Um, and so this is another similar thing showing um, that the dam would have been between Cold Mill and Guess, um, shows you just how far some of the flooding would have gone. Um, one of the unique things about the Eno River is all the hills and all the tributaries. Um, so you can see a lot of little creeks, a lot of little branches. Um, so there's a lot of elevation change. There would have been a lot of nooks and crannies in this reservoir. In August of 1966, Durham decides to move forward. And so there our fight begins um, and they really start to Get their plans together, start to look for land on building a dam to create a reservoir. Um, it doesn't take long, of course, for formal opposition to arise. Um, in August of 1966, Durham buys their first plot of land. 
in October of 1966, the Eno uh, Historical Society becomes the Association for the Preservation of the Eno River Valley. Um, now we know them as the Eno River Association, still doing a lot of work to protect the Eno River. Um, the association um, starts to get, get excuse me, the association incorporates and begins to fight um, back against Durham. And they start to contact different officials for different solutions. They reach out to the Regional Triangle Planning Commission. They reach out to local city council members, local newspapers. They start to host hikes, canoe trips, create maps, research history, they even inventoried wildlife. Again, a lot of the same stuff that we as park rangers and park staff still do today. Um, something really remarkable to show how effective they were is that for their first guided hike, they had about 75 people show up. That being said, I've most maybe had 10 or 20 on a hike, even today as a state park. But the really impressive thing is that on their second hike, they had 400 people. And so they really started to get the community involved, got a lot of interest, a lot of people concerned about the Eno River. Something else that they started um, that's still a tradition going on today is the first day hike. So they started to hold a big hike on January 1st. And um, they were doing it. National Parks is something else that has been picked up um, elsewhere. Um, and then through that combination, now North Carolina State Parks do it. Um, starting back in 2016, I think every state park has been required to, to do a first day hike for everybody. Um, for us at Eno, that tradition goes back to before the park, so more than 50 years. Um, when we have a good day for our first day hikes, we can get um, up to seven or 800 people out on that first day just on the hike alone. Pulling a quote from the uh, association's website, a new model for river conservation and one that would be replicated across North Carolina and beyond was being created. Um, so they really started to do a lot of innovative things and a lot of new thoughts and a lot of new ideas on how to preserve our forested areas um, were starting to be implemented here. One thing that they also did was um, a new model for preserving a river, which is what we'll talk about on the next slide a little bit. Not that things ever really go bad um, from the association uh, for what I can tell in this fight. Um, of course, there's gonna be ups and downs, but this incorporation and when they kind of formalize is when things really start to go right. Um, Margaret and the association were very skilled at knowing who to reach out to, um, council, members, council members, other politicians, um, and then pairing that contact with other public support. Um, and what makes this skill really special is the argument that went along with it. Protecting the Eno was not about their homes or their land value, their daily lives. Of course, that's going to be an important factor to these people. Um, but the fight was really about the beauty and the uniqueness of the valley. So the public programs were important to highlight biodiversity, cultural and geologic history. Um, there's a lot of mill sites and even cemeteries still in the park. Um, the land on the Eno that the state park now protects is special in its geology, even from just downstream um, where West Point, there's a lot of differences. And it covers a stretch of river with a lot of rock and steep hills, steep banks, like I was talking about on the, the map on the last slide. So instead of more flat floodplains um, that you get just downstream or down towards the coast. The association did a lot of work with slideshows and um, pictures and posters to be able to show off these features. So now Durham was already buying land and if they had wanted to, they could have just used eminent domain to make everything happen. Um, so the association realized this and knew that they needed somebody higher than Durham and to supersede that power. Um, and so they decided to get the state involved and start looking into the idea of a state park. Um, we really kind of get the perfect storm here. Because at the same time, the Nature Conservancy is actually looking for their first project in North Carolina and looking to get a foothold into the state. And so they are very eager, look, eager to help out as well. Just like that, the Eno River is saved. Um, I know that seems really fast into this conversation. Uh, I do have a method to my madness, so we'll just keep sticking it out with me, I promise. Um, when we look at other state parks and even national parks, the aim is to create a buffer around a preserving feature, such as a mountain or a lake. Um, at the time, there were no parks in North Carolina that were linear and thin like you would need for a river. 
somewhere like Ravens Rock, Jockey Ridge, Mount Mitchell, um, you would have a namesake central feature um, and did your best just to get land around it. Now, when we talked about the park map earlier, you can see just how spread out we were, how much development there was, and so how jagged and tough having our boundary and our land can be. Um, there's still a few places where we don't own the riverbank. Um, the state does not own the riverbank, and so there's still a private ownership. A lot of the area was already developed, and so this started to create problems with the idea of a state park. Uh, mainly making that buffer would be really difficult, and then park operations today are really spread out. Um, with the connection of the Nature Conservancy, the Ena River Association, and public support from the two groups, along with their connections in the General Assembly, the idea persisted and the Nature Conservancy was actually able to gain a key piece of land that then was able to um, change Durham's viewpoint about being able to expand. So on June 15th, 1973, Governor James Holhauser made it official and the park began its operations. Um, the first piece of land that was granted to the park was acquired in August of 1973. Um, it was not actually a part of the park. Um, we don't own it anymore. It was land on Highway 70 that was not adjacent to the river. Um, it was given to the state with the intent of being sold for funds for more tracks. Um, the actual first piece of land um, that we still have and is operating was around the Fuse Ford area and became the central area for our main access. So why the change? Why that sudden jump there? Um, a little bit of explanation is that um, a few factors there. Um, public perception was a big one and Raleigh decided to back out. So as I had mentioned, Raleigh was looking for their water source and so we're hoping to just kind of get get whatever Durham made, um, use it for them for a while, and then do their own thing. Um, when the public perception started to push back and become so negative, Raleigh decided to um, back out. Durham also realized that the potential yield of the reservoir would not be able um, to supply as much water as they would need. Um, so they started to look for other supplements, such as an old quarry from Nello Tier, um, where they had cored out rock. Um, they used that as an emergency water supply and started to, to look a bit, a little bit more. Um, if you'll remember from earlier, Nello Tier was that company and person, businessman that Margaret had been a thorn in the flesh of. And so you can see their partnership um, working with Durham there as well. Durham also realized that they were going to need water more quickly. Um, so not only did they realize that the Eno wasn't going to be as bountiful, but that they would need it a lot faster than they had originally thought. Um, this is really good on their part that they had started so early, um, started this planning. Remember they were anticipating by the 90s or the 2000s that they could need water. Um, so as that clock started to tick, it was a good thing they had started this process already. Um, they did start to look at other more um, other water sources as term, and we'll get to those on our next slide. As I've mentioned, the Nature Conservancy had managed to acquire a key piece of land near where the dam wanted to go, where Durham wanted to put the dam, um, and then proceeded to deed that piece to the state. Um, so that was a pretty big blow as well. Through all these combinations of the uh, combination of events, Durham decided to abandon their plans. Um, the state offered Durham 2.2 million for all the land west of Guest Road most of which is the land between Guest Road and Cole Mill, um, from what I've heard. They totaled about 600 acres, and then the rest is history, and the park is now well over 43, 4,500 acres. Some of the other water sources that Durham looked at, um, of course, they were looking at the Inner River Reservoir, but then they wanted to raise the existing dam on Lake Mickey, uh, which is part of the Flat River, they wanted to build a new dam on the Flat River above Lake Mickey, or they wanted to build a new dam on the Little River. Um, option number four there is what won out, and so we got the Little River Reservoir um, on the Little River. Part of option two, um, raising the existing dam on Lake Mickey, um, and option three, building a dam on the Flat River above Lake Mickey. Um, came with its own set of repercussions. Uh, North Carolina State University has the Hill Educational Forest up there. So any of options involving the Flat River um, would have 
flooded out or altered, the ecosystem would have had a negative impact on their forestry, um, on the forest there. So I'm sure that NC State um, and the Dean of Forestry there could probably have fought their own battles. Um, but in looking through the Margaret Nygaard collection, there is a letter um, to the Dean offering their help. Um, it promises to share information, information um, make a public stand if need be. And so I've got that letter on the next slide. Again, in 1988 um, is when the Luba River Reservoir was completed. So it took a long time um, during this whole um, fight for the Eno for Durham's actual water source to be completed. Here is a copy of that letter um, from Margaret Nygaard to the Dean of NC State School of Forestry. Um, it was written in October of 1972, so that puts us about nine months before the official announcement of the state park. Um, so at that point, um, nine months out, you can tell that Durham is already looking for other options if this is something they need to talk about. Um, also at this point, October of 1972 means the Inner River Association is turning six years old, um, so they're celebrating that anniversary as well. This letter to me is a great example but both Margaret and the association as a whole going beyond that standard NIMBY, not in my backyard activism, their concern goes beyond the Eno River, it goes beyond their homes, and it was a genuine concern um, for the environment to be preserved and be protect, protected. The association continues to do amazing work in the name of the Eno River Valley and other areas. They host the Eno River Festival, they do camps and programs, hikes, they still help, help with land. Um, so they're still doing a lot of good work um, elsewhere and they're expanding as well. I'd like to show this letter because Margaret also mentions reaching out to HUD and name drops both the local representative for HUD but also the secretary. So it's another good example of their political acumen and their success as a whole and being able to reach out to um, different politicians. Some of the early plans um, for the state park, as the state began to plan the park, a lot of different studies were done for the feasibility of the park and ideas about how it would look. The Eno River Master Plan addresses visitors from key areas such as Durham, Raleigh, Burlington, Greensboro, and even Danville, Virginia, thinking that those would be the main areas where we saw visitors from. The amount of traffic traveling six different roads throughout the parkland was also studied along with the busiest road being US 70 from Hillsborough to Durham. And so the master plan highlighted um, where people would be coming from, how they'd get here and talked about different traffic and congestion as well. The master plan did highlight that the area now known as Coal Mill was already actively used by the public and so then would present a greater management problem to park staff. It mentions a non-resident landowner of the Fuse Ford area that allowed a lot of activities such as swimming and even four-wheelers and buggies to ride in the river. I've also heard that people would drive their cars down to the river and wash them um, at the fords in the shallow spots. The plan, much like the work done by the Una River Association, highlights the unique uses of the river, um, the climate, the geography, the geology, the hydrology, um, so it's piggybacking on a lot of that work done by the Eno River Association to highlight why this park was unique. Um, our original plan included six focal accesses, six main areas, um, five of which have come to fruition. The only one that hasn't is a small access on Lawrence Road in Orange County um, that just is a little bit small at the time. Planning for the park, um, part of this master planning also lays out early trails, parking lots, where a park office would be, a mountainous area, and lays out interpretation guides for the Piper Cox House and other roadside displays. So it's really setting the groundwork for how the park looks today. One of my fun facts from this master plan, um, which actually is something you guys can find online with a little bit of, of searching, is that it laid out how rangers would be patrolling the area and how we would be assigned. It stated that in order to patrol and to check on the park that we would do it one on foot, two on horseback, and three mobile units with two ray radios. And I always tell everybody that I am still waiting on my horseback. 
planning of the park uh, was not always easy. Um, it'd be easy to think that the you know, River Association did their work and made a state park. It was announced and here we are 50 years later. Um, however, when the master plan started in 1975, three plans illustrated showed a river corridor from Geth Road all the way almost to Hillsborough covering about 18 miles. Um, however, landowners in Orange County were upset about these plans, which leads us into our next fight. This new fight would be putting the master plan on hold and it would not resume until three years later in 1978. Of course, I wish I could say it was smooth sailing, that everything was pleasant and um, easy going for everybody, um, but it never is. We are on the side again of history that remembers Margaret and the association fondly, um, but not everybody was happy about the announcement of a state park. And especially when they saw the plans that were presented to the public, it started to create a lot of unrest. And so we get the Eno River Group to save the Eno River from the Association for the Preservation of the Eno River. Um, definitely a mouthful there. I'll refer to them just as the Eno River Group. Um, but you can see right there from their title that they're set up in direct opposition to the association. They form in 1973, and they were scared of what the association could do. Um, I had mentioned that the association got the state involved because they needed somebody with a bit more power than Durham. The Durham could have used eminent domain um, on the landowners, and so then the state used eminent domain um, to override Durham. Now, the Inner River Group is sitting here with their land, and mainly in Orange County, and seeing the association kind of bend the ear of the state, maybe to get a state park wherever they wanted. So it made a lot of unrest for these landowners. Now at the time, it was state park policy to not elicit local preference when considering parks, um, especially in the way of layouts, boundaries, or where access is, um, but they would hold meetings about the plans to uh, show it to the public. Um, again, the association had gotten the state and higher powers involved, and so for this Eno River group, it kind of looking like they were the, the small group left out in the rain that they could um, kind of be passed over by the state. In 1975, the state had already acquired close to 1,000 acres and was still planning and starting that master planning like we talked about. The voice opposition of the Eno River group um, was against the expansion of the park into um, Orange County, so across the Orange County line. Um, the state parks held a public meeting in Hillsborough to present their different plans, and the Eno River group attended presenting their petition opposing condemnation of land, which was in fact signed by several hundred people. Um, so they also did have their own contingency and own support as well. The Eno River group at the time was largely responsible for the Hillsborough Town Board voting unanimously against the uh, voting unanimously against the state park expansion. Um, and also for the unanimous opposition of the Orange County commissioners um, to several of the state's plans. Um, they basically did not want to see the state park expand beyond Cates Ford. Um, for anybody familiar, Cates Ford was the original name in planning of Hughes Ford, um, our main access. For many of these Orange County natives, land had been in their family for generations. Um, and so they weren't willing to just give it up without their own fight. Um, two of their major issues that they brought up was that condemnation had been threatened, both implicitly and explicitly, in order to persuade owners to sell to the park and that not sit well. Um, they also took issues with the state's failure to consult with the residents and to make information more publicly available. The group believed that the association had inside channels, and remember I've been talking about their political connections um, and how they knew who to talk to, um, so this is a pretty easily to follow belief by the Inover group um, that they would have an inside track. The group filed suit um, against the state to prevent them from adopting a master plan, which is what led to that three year stay. To help put things into perspective um, from the Eno River Group's standpoint, um, one member saw an early plan of the state park at a meeting um, and the boundary of the state park was actually dividing their land into two separate tracks. Um, which meant the state was planning on taking some of their land as well as splitting their land in half. The landowner had raised objections through the proper channels um, and thought things that would be settled. Um, when they attended the next meeting, however, 
the land and the map were still the same. So that created a lot of unease and a lot of distrust um, that was pretty easy to see. The group supports and arguments, however valid, um, however easy it is to track, um, were generally not based on the merits of a state park or about the biology, geology, uniqueness, and that intrinsic value that the association focused on, um, or even about costs and benefits to Orange County um, and pros and cons, but it was more about their land. Um, the association had put the value to the land, whereas the Inner River Group tend to put value to their land. Ultimately, this fight did lead to the construction of the park moving forward, um, but did slow it down and kind of changed how things were shaped. The original plan for the park um, included about 2,800 acres. Now we are protecting over 4,300. Um, but also said that obtaining private land would be implemented in four different phases over the next 12 years. So it helped to slow down that process and some of the last land to be acquired in the last plan would be some of that Orange County land where the Eno River Group lived. Um, this was hopefully going to give everybody enough time for temperaments to settle down and to reach settlements and agreements about acquisitions and prices. Um, at the time, land acquisition for the park involved more than 116 individual landowners. So there's a lot of people to work with. Um, so our fight is never open. Even though we do get a master plan, we get through the Inga River Group controversy. Um, we open operations with about 1,100 acres to the public with plans to add more. Um, at the time I put open that we opened in quotations um, because what the park would have opened as will definitely not be recognizable to anybody today. Um, we would have opened with just a gravel lot and a gate and probably a road into the woods. Um, it would take that long master planning process for the efforts and resources to be built. Um, with the formation of the park, Margaret Nygaard and the Inner River Association, fortunately, they did not take that as a cue to give up and just rest on their laurels. They knew that there would be more fights to come. Um, Durham would go on to propose running new sewer lines across the river in 24 different locations. Um, so of course that got the attention of the Inner River Association. They pushed back. Um, Durham changed their plan to running it for eight miles just alongside the river. Um, there's not any major sewage line running through the state park, but I do know that it runs along West Point um, and that there have been issues with some of that um, spilling over and different flooding events. In the 1980s, there's also a plan that arises for a Dew Raleigh or Durley connector in the Eno Drive to be built through some of the park, um, basically a scenic drive that would have gone right through. This at the time was emphasized as being a green corridor, uh, a parkway of sort, such that would have been a nice scenic drive and not a lot of traffic. Um, as those plans developed and as the association put fights against it, it turned out that there would have been a lot of traffic in a major throughway, producing a lot of pollution and a lot of sound pollution as well. There was also textile mills along the river that continued to dump toxic dyes. Um, I believe one of them was still in Hillsborough in the downtown area that the association helped um, to stop the dumping there as well. The reach of Margaret Nygaard, her efforts, and the Eno River Association extends well beyond the park. Um, we talked about North Carolina State, um, but in 1990 as well, the General Assembly shot down $120 million budget requests for state parks um, to keep up major for major upkeep in existing parks, but also new parks. Um, the state then considered selling off roughly 80% of land protected at William B. Umstead State Park in order to make up that budget downfall. Um, anybody not familiar with Umstead State Park, it sits between RDU, Highway 70, Rex Hospital, and Interstate 40. So it would have been a pretty good crop of land. It definitely would have helped to have that budget, um, but it was definitely worth protecting that area and keeping that nature. And so for the end of our story um, with Margaret, she passes away in 1995 on the morning of an association meeting. Um, she didn't show up and was late and word quickly spread to the meeting that what had happened. Um, throughout her time as a preservationist and often as the face of the association, Margaret was always quick to shrug off her leadership uh, and to quote anything about herself as myth-making. She always made a point to say us when talking about efforts from the association. 
Um, again, she is the spotlight that we focus on, but there are a lot of people, there's a tireless group of families and people still working today to keep it going. <clears throat> Margaret had served um, as executive vice president, as well as some, several other roles within the association. Um, and the association knew that moving forward without Margaret would be tough. Um, they said that nobody would do as much as she did uh, with as little financial compensation, um, that she really just gave everything she had. Um, Margaret also served on the Durham County Open Space Committee um, and in 1988 was asked to speak before the U.S. House and federal funding for conservation. Um, so her influence was spread far and wide and is still a force today with things. As I wrap up, um, I've included this quote from an interview with Margaret um, about, uh, this is from 1989, about the river. She said, there's something very stagnant about a man-made lake. To us, a river is a very vibrant thing, changing mood, changing seasons. It's kind of restorative. It replenishes after walking on pavement and being under city lights. It's very genuine. To me, this is a really great connection and representation of Margaret and of the love and adoration that she and, and others must have felt for the river. Um, in that same interview, Margaret mentions um, that she was often barefoot along the river, um, so very connected to it. The Inner River Valley was very much her home. She recognized the importance of protecting our green spaces before many federal protections were written. Um, parks along the river now serve to give everyone the chance to find that restoration that Margaret was talking about. I do take a moment here just for a little bit of a plug. Like I've said, the Inner River Association is still very active. They serve as our friends group. They still help us with programs, a lot of education, help getting people interested. They still do the Inner River Festival. Um, couple pictures here, they do activities like bingo. They have a journal for sale, merchandise as well. Um, the picture up top there are some of the original founders as well as a picture of Margaret. I do have a link here if anybody would be interested in supporting the Uno River Foundation or Association um, or helping out with anything. My last slide here kind of ties this back to myself personally. It's a quote to leave you guys with from the wildlife in North Carolina from 1982. Um, Margaret recalled fighting against Durham at City Hall and said that one of the city councilors told her, I knew the Eno as a boy and kicked a stone all the way from Pea Creek to Senate Hole, and I didn't know it was beautiful. Margaret reflected on this quote and added, but it's in his bones, he loves that river. It's just not that everybody knows what they appreciate could be worthwhile to someone else. Um, I really appreciate this quote and enjoy it because as I said, I grew up along the river, uh, I played in the creeks, but still it was just kind of the thing that was there. It, it wasn't anything special to me. Um, now I see the beauty, I see the value, and it's something that I get to, to share with all of you. Um, and that being said, that is the end of my presentation. So thank you guys, everybody. And I think we can do questions for now. Thank you so much, Lawson. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of questions coming in. The first one is, um, is there just uh, more information on Margaret and kind of her impact and legacy towards the Eno River? Um, so yeah, so like finding more information, um, there's a lot of stories. Um, there's um, a lot of research that's been done. So we have some documents and folders and stuff at, at the park that I've gone through. There's also the Margaret Nygaard collection at UNC, which I think you have to make an appointment for, um, but is open to the public. And then just with a lot of Googling and, and digging on the internet, um, you can find a lot of different articles, especially because some of this fight would have been so publicized at the time, you can find a lot of information there. Thank you. Um, another question we have is just what is some of your, what, what is your favorite part about working at the Eno River State Park? Um, so hmm, to get really specific, my favorite part, um, I'll actually go all the way back if we can. Let me get back through here. My favorite part um, is what I've got right here, the um, salamander eggs and the salamander there. Um, that's a marble salamander. Um, there's those eggs that are in my hand are part of a spotted salamander. Um, and these were species that were found in the mountains uh, when I went to college and got really into. And so to find these species here um, was a really cool, fascinating opportunity. And I do programs throughout the year to try to go look for them. 
Um, there's a lot of, I've, I've harped on the unique geology and all that of the Eno. Um, there's a lot of species that we're not quite coastal and we're not quite mountainy. Um, we're a weird little Piedmont where we get a bit of both in some things. Um, so some of these salamanders are found in the mountains. We get the mud puppy, which is found in the Noose River watershed. Um, so there's a lot of unique stuff here. It's a very interesting park. Thank you. Uh, just like one more question we have is um, just about what other um, programs or things uh, that well, we can do for the Inner River State Park. Um, yeah, so we offer a variety of programs. Um, the rangers usually um, we're stuck to doing stuff on the weekdays, um, but we do have a park naturalist who offers stuff on the weekends. So we have everything from toddler treks and arts and crafts for little ones and story times. Um, I tend to do some more sciencey ones and try to do um, things looking for salamanders or snakes and turtles. Um, we also have a lot of history talks of people who live in the park. Um, this conversation, the pump station. So there's a lot of different programs. Um, the Inner River Association also leads hikes. They do a spring wildflower hike series. They do a, water, a winter hike series, highlighting different things. Um, a lot of good knowledge out there. So still a lot of programs. We post them to our website. Um, we post them to the Inner River Association website. Um, and having attendance on those is always is always fun. Well, thank you so much, Lawson, um, for helping us to celebrate Earth Day <laughs> uh, by sharing this incredible history. Um, and thank you for all the work that you guys are doing to preserve and educate the public about this about this special space. This is awesome. I know you've inspired me to get out there and explore more. So I'm sure you've inspired our other attendees as well. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you, everybody, um, so much for having me. This is um, done this about maybe four or five times now, so it's always a fun one. Um, lots of different groups are always interested in this talk. Um, and going back to the map and other stuff about the Inner River is that there's so many different parking lots. There's so many different access points. Um, if you go to Pump Station, you can see those ruins. Um, other places, you can see grave sites. Some areas are more rocky. Some are more water and slow. Um, or deeper water and slow. Um, so there's really a lot of unique places and really each parking lot kind of brings something different, um, different set of trails and different area to get out to. Awesome. Yeah. And so I dropped the uh, link to the state park website in the chat. So you guys definitely go check it out. And um, I know I will be. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, thank you guys for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next uh, program coming up in May as we celebrate Longleaf Film Festival with History and Highballs still starring North Carolina that takes place on Thursday evening, May 2nd at 7 p.m. over Zoom. In the meantime, we hope all of you have a lovely day and we'll see you soon. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you, everybody.